Good afternoon. This is the Corusco Conference Operator. Welcome and thank you for joining the SAM 2020-2024 Strategic Plan Presentation. As a reminder, all participants are in an only mode. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Should anyone of assistance during the conference call, they may signal an operator by pressing star and zero on their telephone. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mr. Marco Alvera, CEO of NAM. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to SNAM's 2020-2024 strategy presentation. I hope that you, your families and your colleagues are well and I look forward to seeing you again in person soon. The plan we present today is about SNAM's exciting journey towards a net zero carbon future. This journey has three significant implications. First, getting to net zero ourselves. We intend to be the first in our sector to do so by 2040. Secondly, our assets play an essential role to get to net zero, which means that it, it extends the long-term RAB growth potential. Third, the energy transition businesses that we have built now face exciting growth prospects. All this makes SNAM a market leader in the race to net zero. Our target of net zero by 2040 is the most ambitious in the industry so far. Already by 2030, we commit to cutting emissions by half, which means taking out approximately 800,000 tons of CO2 equivalent. Almost half of this reduction will come from installing new dual fuel gas electric compressor stations, which will also help with the sector coupling. We will also reduce methane emissions by 45% by 2025 compared to 2015 in line with the UNEP framework. ESG remains at the core of our strategy and in the backup you will find our new ESG scorecard which defines our 22 targets on which you will be kept up to date. Getting to net zero is one of the biggest challenges of our generation and it faces significant hurdles and requires unprecedented investments and cross-industry cooperation. Countries accounting for 50% of global emissions have set or are in the process of setting full decarbonization goals. China recently announced its ambition to peak CO2 by 2030 and get to net carbon zero by 2060. Meanwhile, the US has recently signaled its intention to rejoin the Paris Agreement and set its own net zero targets. Putting together different sources indicates that between 100 and $150 trillion of investments are required across the value chain. The mobilization of resources will be significant and SNAM is ideally positioned to play a key role in this super cycle. Our position in the super cycle is firmly anchored on our midstream assets, which continue to generate attractive investment opportunities and visible cash flows for the very long term as they provide flexibility to the energy system and play an essential role in getting to net zero. In addition, there are we are building positions upstream and downstream of our, of our assets in hydrogen, in biomethane, production infrastructure and final uses with a focus on mobility. Finally, we've created an energy efficiency platform offering our clients the opportunity to lower their own energy consumption, their energy bills, and reducing their environmental footprint. A net zero future places renewables at the core of many of our activities. In this context, it will become increasingly strategic to invest in the space. We're also interested in leveraging our core competences in adjacent segments, such as water. Neither of these opportunities are currently included in the plan that we present today. We believe that we're well positioned to thrive in this new phase thanks to the groundwork we have put in place over the last four years. There are six reasons why SNAM will succeed in a net zero environment. First, our early commitment to ESG and to net zero. Second, the fact that our regulated asset base is future proof and a crucial part of the energy transition. 
Third, our team's unparalleled project management and execution capabilities. For the 14th year in a row, and despite COVID, we will close our investment program this year on time and on budget, including a very complex project like TAP, where we have assumed the project's leadership among our senior peer group. Fourth, the four startups in the energy transition have established themselves as business leaders in each of their segments, and they will generate outstanding growth and value creation. Fifth, our enhanced international footprint and product portfolio, which allows us to pursue additional decarbonization initiatives. And finally, we have repositioned SNAM and funded these initiatives, maintaining our strict financial discipline. We've kept a strong balance sheet while paying superior returns to shareholders and growing our overall profitability. Let's now take a closer look at the market. The green gas revolution we have been an early advocate of is finally well underway. As countries think about what net zero looks like, the role of green gas for hard to abate sectors, long distance transport and seasonal storage becomes clear, leading to strong policy support. On that basis, the share of green gas in 2050 is expected to be above 25%. The role of gas infrastructure assets in delivering net zero has also become much clearer over the past 12 months. Unprecedented collaboration, technical testing, and information sharing among leading TSOs leads to the conclusion that the European grid requires limited retrofit and new build to be hydrogen ready. The unique feature of green gases is that they're not a transition fuel, but like solar and like wind and like most of the hydropower, these are considered forever fuels. Phase one of the role of gas in the energy transition is the switching from coal and diesel to natural gas. This is already economically competitive in a number of sectors, including power generation and heavy transport. Fuel switching provides immediate CO2 savings at the lowest abatement cost and has the potential of adding 400 billion cubic meters of gas demand, according to the World Energy Outlook. Looking at the longer term and the phase two of the transition, which is a scaling up of hydrogen, this is now looking even closer than it was last year, as costs are falling faster than we had anticipated. The level of cost of hydrogen is driven by the cost of renewable electricity, the cost of electrolyzers, and the load factor. As we see renewable power reaching new lows, the key change compared to last year is a 15% lower cost of electrolyzers already for 2020. This 15% reduction has been achieved as the manufacturers are envisaging and looking to the great demand visibility that they're now getting because of the policies. We now think that with around 25 gigawatts at a global level of incremental and predictable electrolyzer demand, we could get hydrogen production costs, green hydrogen production costs, down to $2 per kilo, which is a tipping point when it becomes competitive in several applications. This can be achieved before 2030 with 25 gigawatts of electrolyzer demand in areas where favorable renewable conditions exist, like the Middle East and North Africa and other deserts for solar. On top of production costs, the hydrogen will need to be transported, distributed and stored and used in refilling stations before it gets to the consumer. With regards to transport, pipelines are by far the most convenient way to access large am amounts of renewable energy from distant locations. This Bloomberg NAF analysis shows how by 2050, hydrogen imports to Germany from North Africa will cost around $1 per kilo and will be cheaper than the hydrogen produced locally from offshore wind farms 
than blue hydrogen and much cheaper than the hydrogen imported via ship from the Middle East or other remote locations with pipeline costs around one-tenth of shipping costs when it comes to hydrogen. Based on this and on other studies, the cheapest way for Germany to source green hydrogen is potentially through our existing Italian pipeline network. We believe that hydrogen will become competitive in a number of sectors faster than expected. Broadly speaking, we think that rail and heavy transport will switch at a delivered cost of between five and seven dollars a kilo, including transport storage and distribution, equivalent to an underlining production cost of two to three dollars a kilo. Next up are the industries that would use hydrogen as a direct feedstock, so refining and steel DRI, where it becomes competitive in the, nine, in the 2030s. The third block to become competitive is where hydrogen would be used for thermal uses mainly instead of natural gas. This is not an easy hurdle to overcome because natural gas is very competitive. But on the plus side, there are not many additional costs needed to deliver the hydrogen, as many of these in industries are already linked to our gas grids and volumes are significant, so economies of scale are also significant. We would expect this third group to start to switch in the 2030s and through to the 2040s. The above projections are built absent policy interventions, which we expect will be there and will offer significant support to accelerate this. Of course, the policy support from Europe is moving strongly, and now Europe targets 40 gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity for hydrogen by 2030. The six countries that have so far published their own strategies or guidelines already account for 30 gigawatts between them. The sectors that are being targeted are largely mobility, where the cost gap between diesel and hydrogen is smallest, and industry which can provide significant volumes with minimal infrastructure requirements. Both Portugal and Italy also foresee a role for blending hydrogen in the gas grid which is very interesting because it enables a rapid ramp up in production volumes and therefore a decline in the price of hydrogen even before the consumption markets are developed. Such policies can speed up the transition considerably at very low costs. The good news is that compared to the early stages of the renewable transition, we can now bridge the gap to switching much more cheaply because we can benefit from the 20-year learning rate in renewables and the dramatic fall that we've seen in their production costs. We expect specific policies to support green hydrogen production as well as incentives to help consumers switch to hydrogen, potentially of different colors. Italy's hydrogen strategy guidelines were published yesterday. The country targets a 2% share of the energy mix by 2030 and up to 20% by 2050. That amounts to around 700,000 tons of hydrogen by 2030 or 23 terawatt hours with investments of 10 billion euros. This will be partly generated by electrolysis in Italy with a target of 5 gigawatts of installed capacity by 2030. And we will be destined for industry, heavy transport and trains and hydrogen will be blended into the natural gas grid up to 2%. A 2% blend by volume is already possible throughout our network and including our underground storages without any significant investments. The Italian strategy document also highlights that Italy can benefit from well-developed existing gas infrastructure and that it should leverage its geographic position to import hydrogen from North Africa and be able to export it to the rest of Europe. The development of hydrogen has significant implications for our infrastructure. We have scenarios run at 18 and 20% penetration by 2050. And because of hydrogen's lower density, volumes of gas in our pipelines increase significantly. They rise to over 90 BCM from 70 BCM today at a 25% share. And even at 18%, they would be higher in 2050 
than they are today. We expect to see a coexistence of natural gas with CCS, of biomethane, and of hydrogen in our mix, with the former decreasing and the later two increasing over time. We already started advanced work to determine how we will deliver this transition through our infrastructure, including storage. We expect large volumes of green hydrogen to be produced in our sunny south and consumed mainly in the north. Our infrastructure will add significant resilience, flexibility and security to an energy system based on intermittent and faraway renewables. Let's now move to our plan. Our CapEx plan for the period has increased by 14% to 7.4 billion euros. Of this, 6.7 is in our core infrastructure, up from 6.1 last year. The increase is largely driven by 640 million euros of additional investments in maintenance and replacements required to offset the increasing aging of our network. An additional 90 million in IT to increase the safety and efficiency of operations. We're also envisaging a reduction of 200 million in development capex, mainly due to a rephasing of the Sardinian project. In this plan, we have nearly doubled investments in the energy transition to over 700 million euros. These are not part of our RAB, but we select projects and businesses with an accretive risk-reward profile compared to our regulated business. These businesses have collectively already become EBITDA positive in 2020, notwithstanding COVID, and they will ramp up quickly and exceed 150 million of EBITDA by 2024. The main scenario assumptions underpinning our plan are a stable WAC after 2022 and the deflator of 0.9% for our rep. We're not yet including in our numbers any effect from last week's Denora announcement and its possible contribution as a seed asset to a new energy transition investment platform. Approximately 50% of our CAPEX is hydrogen ready. This is defined as a replacement and development investments in our assets carried out in accordance with hydrogen ready standards. A further 9% is dedicated to investments which increase efficiency to reduce our scope one and two emissions, 7% to digitalization and 9% to the new energy transition businesses. Approximately 40% of our total capex is taxonomy aligned on the basis of the still evolving criteria, a classification which has recently been certified by a third party. Looking in more detail at the capex plan in Italy, this includes more than 1,170 kilometers of pipeline replacements in the next four years. Our dual fuel compressor stations, which provide flexibility to the system as we can choose whether we use gas or electricity to compress gas. Third, looking at Sardinia, the project has been rephased to start with supply as the first section of the backbone. The plan now envisages the construction of a virtual pipeline to bring LNG from Panigalia and all to regasification facilities to Sardinia, with the gas coming into a floating regasification and storage unit or more units linked to the first parts of the backbone that will be developed gradually. So finally, Sardinia can get access to gas with a project that sees everyone in agreement. We confirm our initial view that 70% of the piping is already 100% hydrogen ready. We have defined procurement standards for the hydrogen ready mechanical components and pipes for replacements and for development work. We're continuing to work on blending hydrogen and natural gas grid. And as mentioned, we have very recently determined that a 2% blend is now technically acceptable throughout the network, including storage without any intervention. We have tested the world's first hybrid hydrogen turbine for blends up to 10%. And this turbine will be installed in our gas compressor station in Istrana next year. We are engaging with industrial users, uh, users of hydrogen, our clients, people connected to our grid 
on the possible use of hydrogen in their thermal processes, including steel mills and power plants and other uses of hydrogen. Lastly, we are promoting and sharing knowledge and technologies among a core group of almost a dozen um, TSOs in what is called the Hydrogen Gas Asset Readiness Initiative, which is proving to be a very effective collaboration among peers in Europe. Digitalization is another key investment priority with nearly 500 million euros earmarked in the plan period to become what we think will be the world's most technologically advanced gas TSO. We will develop world-class data-driven infrastructure also with the support of top, top technology partnerships. We're making our assets more secure and more efficient and we aim to sell our capabilities for dual fuel management and network optimization to customers worldwide through SNAM Global Solutions and also through some of our technology partnerships with our providers. The key area of work in our core business is a replacement of our fully amortized pipelines. A large share of our network was built in the 70s and given an amortization time of 50 years, that means that these investments are exit, exiting the RAB as we speak. Indeed, we have now over 9,000 kilometers of pipes which are already fully amortized and despite replacing almost 1,200 kilometers over the plan period, this figure will remain at the same level at the end of 2024. At this level of replacement, the trend is set to accelerate. We have always taken a conservative approach when it comes to replacements, prioritizing the pipelines on the basis of technical considerations. At the same time, we're working with the regulator to determine the appropriate replacement framework. Given the complexity of some of these discussions, we now foresee this constructive dialogue to run into 2021. Looking forward, our replacement requirements are a key driver of our long-term RAB growth. We have accelerated our growth in the plan to above 2.5% per year. Looking 20 years ahead, we expect 2.5% a year to be a floor, as, as this would still leave us with over 11,000 kilometers of fully amortized pipeline by 2040. To be clear, our 2.5% floor is calculated assuming only the necessary replacements from a technical point of view on the basis of our past experience and our continuous network assessments. This growth does not include any investments specifically on hydrogen. We will only replace and or repurpose our assets for hydrogen when and where it will become necessary. Overall, the cost of transporting energy on our network is very low and by far the cheapest compared to other energy sources, be they electrons or molecules. Going forward, this cost advantage will continue to improve relative to other decarbonized options. Moving to our new energy transition businesses. Our first biomethane plant is starting up in December. We now target 64 megawatts of capacity by the end of the plan, up from 42 meg in the previous plan with an investment of 220 million. Expected returns are low double digit with a low risk profile given that they're backed by long-term Italian incentives. In energy efficiency, we have acquired companies with specific competences in key segments. Over the plan period, we will develop a pipeline of projects in the residential sector, also supported by the long-term fiscal incentive, install 70 million of distributed energy systems, CHP, um, photovoltaic and fuel cells, and support deep renovation of public administration buildings. Overall, we see investments of 200 million euros producing stable long-term contractualized returns. In sustainable mobility, we aim to have more than 150 CNG and LNG stations at the end of the plan. We will also develop five flagship hydrogen stations. We will increase our exposure to LNG for transport, 
investing in one micro microliquefaction plant and the upgrading of truck loading facility in Panigalia. Overall, investment in mobility will be around 150 million euros. Lastly, in hydrogen, we are ahead of the curve. Our plan is focused on getting exposure in the first in-the-money applications, consolidating our leadership in technology and positioning ourselves for the larger scale developments and policy-funded segments as they arise. Initial investment is 150 million euros in the planned period, and we expect to have positive EBITDA in this segment by 2024, even before any policy support. Looking at our hydrogen strategy in more detail, a key project is to convert diesel trains to hydrogen where electrification is not possible. We have an agreement in place with the national railway system as well um, as with the train manufacturer Alstom. This project accounts for the majority of our hydrogen capex in the plan at the moment and we expect the first train already in 2022. This project is in the money already without subsidies because diesel is expensive and because the logistics of supplying hydrogen to trains is simpler than supplying hydrogen to other transport vectors. We are expecting other segments of the market to become remunerative through policy support following the publication of the Italian hydrogen guidelines. Hydrogen projects will also be funded by the Recovery Fund and other European and national instruments, such as the important projects of common European interest known as the IPSAI facility. We are participating in the discussions to select projects, seeking to make them solid and bankable. These would represent an upside to our plan. With regards to hydrogen technology, we have recently struck two important partnerships, one with Industria de Nora, a leading company on electrode and water technologies and with very promising hydrogen upside, and the other with a leading PEM electrolyzer manufacturer, ITM, in the UK. Through the acquisition of uh, the investments in these companies and the commercial partnerships, we gain exposure to the fastest growing uh, electrolyzer uh, segments with complementary alkaline and PEM technologies. The acquisitions will also support the ramping up of our hydrogen business unit, as today having access to leading technologies and competences is crucial to win projects, especially when all concepts are a first of a kind and solutions need to be worked through and tailored and custom built. A meaningful part of the Denora stake is expected to be conferred to a new investment platform focused on the energy transition. SNAM will be the anchor investor and the launch of this vehicle will enable us to enhance our exposure to the energy transition um, companies, assets or projects through a limited and ring-fenced investment. We expect this platform to be launched in 2021. Turning now to our international strategy, we have a great portfolio. By the end of the plan period, dividends received by the Austrian, French and UK associates will be far higher than the price we paid for them, meaning that the acquisitions will have been fully paid back in a short time scale. For more recent acquisitions, such as Desfa and Adnoc, by the end of the plan, we expect them to be around 50% paid back already. As a whole, we expect our international portfolio to deliver solid earnings and cash returns above 10% a year on average and offer diversified growth opportunities. Looking at our mature assets in Europe, as indicated already last year, contribution from our Austrian associates reflects the expiry of long-term contracts in 2022 and 2023. We're working to mitigate such effects with shorter term and more flexible contracts, products, as well as gas flows are expected to remain stable in Austria. Meanwhile, Terega is entering biomethane in France and is well positioned on hydrogen given its interconnection potential with Spain. We also have assets exposed to new gas consumption and growth in gas consumption. These include TAP, which will start contributing to earnings 
by 2021 and the recently acquired stake in ADNOC. DESFA also benefits from growing gas consumption in Greece as well um, as incremental supplies to the Balkans also via LNG. Finally, through our dedicated asset light presence in China and India and the commercial reach of SNAM Global Solutions, we can consider opportunities in areas with attractive gas and green gas prospects. Finally, the key piece of news in our associate portfolio is that TAP has been completed and delivered on time despite COVID. We materially contributed to its success by appointing key people such as a former head of our gas assets who became the CEO of TAP and by supporting the company in establishing a relationship with local communities providing local content. Some world leading technologies have been applied and integrated to absolutely minimize the environmental footprint of this project and even accelerate its executions. And we are very proud of what SNAM has been able to achieve in Puglia. I will now hand over to Alessandra for a closer look at our financial structure, capital allocation approach and our main targets. Thank you, Marco, and good afternoon, everybody. Looking at our financial structure, focus remains on de-risking our business plan and preserving the solidity of our balance sheet. Cost of debt is expected at circa 1.2% over the plan horizon, slightly below last year's assumption, thanks to the actions already implemented to lock in favorable market conditions and improve market scenario, both in interest rates and credit spreads. Moreover, we believe that further opportunities of funding cost saving could be achievable thanks to further treasury management optimization via recourse to uncommitted credit lines and commercial papers, an opportunistic approach to managing our maturity profile, and further diversification of investors thanks to increased share of sustainable financing. SNAM solid credit rating quality is confirmed by the fundraising progress in the last few months, notwithstanding COVID. It totaled to 1.2 billion at an average tenor of circa six years and an average cost of 0.3%, while still having seamless access to the uncommitted credit lines and commercial paper markets. In this regard, we highlight that our credit metrics remain comfortable within the threshold set by the rating agencies for a rating one notch higher than our official one for Moody's and Standard & Poor's, even factoring in the full cash out for the acquisition of the Nora stake. Aside from numbers, as customers, we have discussed this transaction with rating agencies who appreciate the sensible and disciplined approach on technology related to energy transition and decarbonization. They like the fact that SNAM will retain exposure to R&D and technology in a key space, such hydrogen, while limiting its capital deployment also in the context of the investment platform expected to be launched in 2021, protecting the low risk profile of both its business and financial structure. We expect net debt to rub, which will reach circa 58% on a rating adjusted basis at year end to decline over the plan horizon as in 2021, the guarantee related to the construction of TAP will be released as a consequence of its entry into operation. Our ESG focus also drives our financing choices. Our commitment was reaffirmed in September when we joined the UN Global Contact and CFO Task Force, which aims at bringing together investors, issuers, banks and credit agencies to create an efficient market for SDG investments in capital flows and consistency in how to measure ESG KPIs. Since the beginning of our journey in 2016, we have sought to increase the share of our sustainable finance. Today, we stand already at 40%. This was achieved through the conversion of our revolving credit facility to a sustainable loan with a bonus-manus mechanism, depending on the achievement of the KPIs which are included in our management incentive plans. 2020 is the second year in a row that we benefit from lower margins thanks to achieving those targets. On the fixed income side, 
SNAM issued the first climate action bond in 2019, followed by its inaugural transition bond just a few months back. Our move from a, credit, a climate action bond to a transition bond was aimed at factoring on one side more ambitious and longer term targets in terms of emission reduction, both in CO2 and CH4, announced at the end of 2019 as part of our last year plan, and the inclusion consistent with the taxonomy definition of new eligible category of retrofit of gas transmission network, whose main purpose is the integration of hydrogen and other low carbon gases. Our ambition is to raise the share of sustainable funding to circa 60% by the end of the plan, leveraging on new ish, uh, fixed income uh, issues out of our transition bond framework or other sustainable like bonds, and an amended and restated commercial paper program linked to an ESG rating, which allows us to issue up to 2.5 billion of ESG notes. Our capital structure leaves us some headroom in terms of leverage, which gives flexibility for potential additional investments not included in our plan. We will complete, continue to apply our strict financial criteria when evaluating any opportunity. As a reminder, we will only invest at or above the risk-adjusted returns available on our regulated organic capex, and we are committed to our current rating metrics and risk profile. Furthermore, we assess opportunities based on whether they enhance the value of our existing assets, allows NAM to play an industrial role, and support additional growth and strategic optionality, but always in coherence with our ESG strategy and broader net zero vision. On the back of this criteria, we have increased our organic capex and carried out bolt-on RAB-like acquisitions, invested in our energy transition businesses, expanded our international footprint and increase cash return to shareholders through dividend and buyback. Looking now at the plan targets, tariff RAB will grow by an average of over 2.5% a year in the period ahead of the prior plan trajectory, which was above 2%. RAB growth will support revenues, which also will benefit from the significant contribution of our new businesses. Our efficiency plan, which will reach 70 million euro by 2022, a year earlier than planned, will also offset growing R&D cost. This will deliver EBITDA growth over the plan of over 3% a year. With the 700 million of investment detailed in the plan, new businesses will reach 150 million euro EBITDA in 2024, with a further circa 50 million beyond 2024. Net profit will grow by 2.5% as a result of the growth in EBITDA, factoring in higher DNA linked to the growing investment plans on both our core business and new businesses. Cost of debt is assumed to be stable. We expect earning per share to grow by over 3%. Consistently with last year, we are conservatively assuming a debt refinancing of the convertible note expiring in 2022 with the subsequent cancellation of Treasury shares. Let's now look more closely at 2021. We expect this to be a year of growth with acceleration in CapEx. We see a positive impact from RAB growth and we are conservatively factoring a broadly stable output base incentives. We are expecting an increase in DNA due to the significant ramp up of our CapEx, higher R&D and business development costs for our platform. We are also expecting the contribution of new business ramp up although more slowly than previously anticipated owing to the COVID disruption. 2021 will benefit from a growth of the contribution from associate with the entry operation of TAP and the contribution of ADNOC, partially offset by the regulatory revision for the Astron associate and the expected normalization of volume impact on tariff for TESFA. Overall, we expect net income to increase by 3% versus our 2020 guidance. Net debt will reach 13.5 billion, driven by increased investments and working capital absorption of circa 200 million, of which approximately 100 connected to our energy efficiency business. With regards to net debt to RAB, throughout the plan, we will remain well below 60%. The ratio with the CLI next year as the top construction guarantee is released. Thank you for your time. I will now hand over back to Marco for his concluding remarks. Thank you, Alessandra. 
The CAPEX plan that we presented today only contains what is firm and visible and is not contingent on new policies or market evolutions. Compared to this, we see four areas of potential upside. First, an increase of RAB CAPEX related to green gases. Second, potentially new hydrogen projects supported by new policies. Third, new biomethane opportunities nationally and internationally also supported by new incentive schemes and further growth leveraging our capabilities and product portfolio also in the circular economy, energy efficiency and renewables in Italy and abroad. As we gain additional certainty on potential investments and projects in these areas, we will update our outlook accordingly. With regards to the dividend, we confirm our previous policy of DPS growth of 5% per year to 2022. Our robust growth profile enables us to extend DPS visibility for a further two years, with a floor of at least 2.5% annual growth in the dividend between 2022 and 2024. This policy is based on our current plan and targets. In the next two years, we expect to gain greater visibility on policies and regulation and opportunities that are above and beyond the plan. Should that lead to a higher structural EPS growth, this would be reflected in the 2023 and 2024 dividend. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our presentation today. The transition to a low carbon economy over the next three decades is among our biggest challenges. For investors, the question is how to gain exposure to what will undoubtedly be a multi-trillion euro investment cycle lasting many years. And it will be important not to repeat mistakes that have been made in the past. We need a no regrets strategy that is relentlessly focused on developing future proof assets and technologies. We need a new collaboration model where different players come together to deliver complex groundbreaking projects. To deliver the changes that we need, investment in the energy transition must be sustainable and it must deliver incremental benefits to society and avoid systemic disruption and excessive costs. SNAM is an exceptional investment opportunity in this environment for four reasons. First, we have a solid and future-proof asset base that guarantees long-term visible and predictable cash flows. Second, we have a distinctive set of new businesses that capture growth and create value in the energy transition. Third, an international footprint exposed to areas of the world that are central in the energy transition. And finally, the balance sheet and cash flows to guarantee a solid credit rating and growing shareholder remuneration. Thank you very much for your attention. Alessandra and I will now be pleased to answer any questions. Excuse me, this is the Costco conference operator. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchdown telephone. To remove yourself from the question queue, please press the star and two. Please pick up the receiver when asking questions. Anyone who has a question may press star and one at this time. The first question is from Javier Suarez with Mediobanca. Please go ahead. Oh, hi, uh, good afternoon and, and thank you for, for the presentation. Uh, uh, two or three questions. Uh, is uh, on the uh, on the uh, medium-term view or long-term view for the company. I think that uh, probably the thing that has uh, surprised me the most is the visibility that the company has given on the RAP growth to 2040, and that is a two and a half percent. That is a significant uh, commitment by the company. And I think that you have mentioned during your presentation that that is simply related to the substitution of the existing pipeline. So yeah, uh, the thing that I would like to, to ask you is to, to try to uh, give us some more granularity on what 
the hydrogen opportunity could bring a food on the table for a company like Vietnam. Uh, what is your latest view on the opportunity that hydrogen means for uh, the necessity to upgrade significantly the carcass of the company in an extended period of time uh, to make uh, uh, this uh, uh, system network of um, hydrogen and compliance? That is the first question. The second question is on the, on the dividend policy. So the, the, what the company has done is to maintain the, the dividend, uh, giving visibility for two additional years, but uh, kind of scaling down the, the dividend growth commitment while the EBITDA and net, in, net income growth are, are similar. So you can uh, help us to, to understand the rationale for, for that decision. Is that because, uh, because, because of the company does see plenty of opportunities and believe that there is better use of capital rather than paying, paying out uh, dividends in 2023 and 2024. So you can help us to, to understand the rationale for that, that would be appreciated. And the third question is on regulation. So obviously the hydrogen market has to be built. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to, uh, to, give, uh, uh, to ask you your latest conversation uh, to the regulator or your proposal to the regulator on how the market should organize. And I am particularly interested on uh, what do you think, how do you think the, the role of the electrolysis should be, if the electrolysis should be part of the regulator, uh, the, the regulatory asset base, and also you can uh, give us uh, some update on regulatory conversation uh, to get some remuneration for the food depreciation asset beyond the useful life. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. That's a rich set of questions. So um, the uh, first um, on... Uh, the granularity of of uh, hydrogen. So, to be clear, uh, the plan does not include any subsidies on hydrogen. So, the two and a half percent RAP growth in the plan and beyond is based on a business as usual, a steady state. Then, there are incremental RAB opportunities potentially if we need to accelerate the hydrogen readiness. Uh, we cannot quantify these in euro amounts. We have said that 70% of our pipes are hydrogen ready, so a lot of the capex would be to the accessories uh, above the ground. Uh, but it's it's hard to tell now uh, how and how much and when that additional money will be spent because what we need to do is understand how much methane methane with CCS either at the entry or the exit of our system, biomethane and hydrogen will coexist. So what we're doing is we are mapping extensively our network. We expect there will be a period of coexistence and there will be some blending opportunities depending on the work we're doing on membranes and other uh, technologies. So uh, there will be uh, hydrogen and biomethane related upsides on the RAB. But on the hydrogen business unit, there will be significant potential upside as what we have in the plan now is just what we see as being in the money with no subsidy. So there's, uh, let's say, two different pockets of potential uh, upside. One is on the RAB linked to how the coexistence, coexistence of biomethane, methane, methane with CCS, potentially CO2, uh, because CO2 needs to be transported as well, and hydrogen uh, all interplay. This is not something we will solve uh, soon. I think it will require a couple of years of working with regulators in Europe um, to understand what other TSOs are doing, working with customers and understanding which technologies take off in which time horizon. Then you asked us, about our dividend philosophy. It's uh, always the same, Javier. Uh, we don't think that over a long period of time we should be growing the dividend more than net income. We've come from extraordinary four years where net income grew a lot faster than we expected. This means that we've been able to uh, pay a high dividend, a very high dividend and dividend growth, and at the same time, bring our payout, as you remember from our early discussions four years ago, from a level where we were uh, not so comfortable to a level, I would say, of absolute comfort today. So that 2.5% kind of aligns with our long-term growth outlook, absent any of the upsides 
that I talked about. So there's no change in philosophy, no change in approach. We have financial flexibility potentially to pay even more, but I think it's right at some point to align the dividend growth to the underlying sustainable long-term net income growth. When it comes to regulation and how the hydrogen market should be organized, I think electrolyzers will need to be incentivized if this is in the form of putting them in the RAB or in the form of uh, electrolyzer specific incentive or in the form of integrated hydrogen, green hydrogen production incentive. We still don't know. We are active in a number of high level dialogues with the European Commission with different member states, with our own uh, institutions and regulators. And I think 2021, as I've indicated earlier, is going to be a year where a lot of collaboration is necessary to determine what uh, is the best way to uh, incentivize this key uh, part of the value chain. What is very clear to us is that we will only invest in this and other opportunities when we see predictable, visible returns that are higher or greater than what we can achieve on our normal uh, regulated activities. I hope I've answered your questions. Many thanks. The next question is from Marke Becca with Bernstein. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for taking my questions. I think I, um, I go with two. Um, the first one is on your um, slide uh, 24 and uh, 28, so, so essentially your um, international footprint and the new businesses. And particularly, I'm wondering about um, the energy efficiency um, going into perhaps electricity a little bit and your um, expansion into China and India. So if you could sort of like elaborate what your presence is today in India and China and what plans or potential you see. And um, relative to what you're doing today, is there appetite to expand your footprint into um, electricity? And I don't mean like operating networks or something. I'm thinking perhaps um, appetite to accelerate or help somehow um, in the green hydrogen production, for example, in North Africa, uh, which would help um, your your core business. So that's question one. Maybe there are two questions in one there. And uh, the uh, the second question is quite simply on your um, efficiencies. Um, if you could sort of like um, elaborate um, uh, what what is happening in terms of um, efficiencies uh, across the plan, or or if something has changed materially, or is that just steadily progressing? Thank you. Thank you, Meiki. I will try to answer uh, your first questions and then ask Ale to step in for um, the cost reduction and the efficiency, efficiency program. Um, so on um, uh, the new businesses, uh, the, in, in India, you may have seen, we've recently signed some MOUs. India is a market that has two uh, very important uh, trends. One is a strong desire to move uh, from diesel to gas when it comes to transport. Uh, just to give a number, India has uh, most of its trains running on diesel. India has 80 gigawatts of diesel-fired electricity uh, generation units. Uh, so there's a big opportunity to invest in liquefaction, in LNG infrastructure, in LNG from transport, in all those eras in CNG where we have developed and are developing uh, niche technologies. Uh, so we hope to be in that market with uh, uh, Znam Global Solutions and looking at uh, projects to deploy uh, our capabilities. When it comes to um, electricity, if you take a project like the trains project that I mentioned, the train company simply expects to be delivered uh, green hydrogen uh, when and where and at the volumes that they require. So uh, we need to worry about producing it, transporting it, storing it, modulating it, and investing in the infrastructure to deliver that. A big part of a program like this is around renewables to produce that green electricity. If the train uh, company in this case wants to say that it's 100% green 
hydrogen, the only way to physically do that is to have dedicated uh, renewables for this. So we have several options. We can purchase the renewable uh, energy and then uh, dedicate that to uh, the electrolyzers. We can build in case there's new, probably new energy needed as the volumes scale up. We can partner with people who already have and who are developing renewables. I think the model is going to be a combination of all three, where we may need to be investors, we may need to partner, we may need to simply buy it from existing sources. So it's early, as I mentioned, to say which form and which model these partnerships will take. What I can say is that listening to um, my my peers and, and other executives, I think there's a consensus building that there will need to be a greater degree of collaboration. When it comes to North Africa, I showed the chart from Bloomberg uh, that is very striking. Their analysis is the same as others, the cost of moving green hydrogen to Central Europe, let's say, because the economics are the same, is a tenth via pipeline. So this offers very significant opportunities. I don't think this is imminent because we don't need those volumes of hydrogen today, nor do we need them by 2030. But I think that's a really concrete uh, long-term opportunity that we are uh, beginning to work on and should continue to be developing. Ale on, uh, sorry, in, in looking at my notes, Javier, I didn't realize you, uh, I missed to answer the fully amortized um, pipeline. So uh, I don't have much to add. We've said in the past that we were dial uh, in dialogue with the regulator. I, I must say that since green gases have become the consensus and so our network uh, long-term life of the network has become now the consensus in Europe with the Commission putting that in writing with the Italian and other national strategies putting it in uh, the highlights that the gas uh, infrastructure is a core element of decarbonization. That alters a little bit the time horizon with which uh, we look at uh, these substitutions and the discussion is no longer just about give me an incentive to postpone, but is naturally entering into as the conversation with you as to, you know, what is the future going to look like? What do we need to replace by when? And so it's a more complex discussion that uh, we will not close this year and that we expect will continue into 2021. Ale, over to you for the cost efficiency targets. Thank you. On the efficiencies, we have uh, slightly increased the target vis-a-vis uh, -vis last year plan and anticipate uh, the uh, year by which we intend to achieve such target to 2022 versus 2023. Uh, it's, it's kind of the same story as we said. It's a long list of uh, uh, small initiatives that uh, are though uh, in, instilling into the company a disciplined approach on how we spend money on things that are really necessary. And effectively, all of this discipline has led to create uh, the room on one side to offset the merger synergies and one of course that we inherited from 2016, but on the other side to create flexibility to accommodate for the investment of the startup or our new businesses without penalizing the overall profitability that we have delivered to our uh, shareholders. Um, given a little bit more detail, this 70 million remains, uh, let's say, uh, 60 to 70 percent related to corporate cost and the rest to operation. Um, and uh, as an additional element of information, that means that if you look at our core uh, perimeter, uh, the, these reduction of costs will allow us by the end of the plan to have slightly lower cost in nominal terms, whilst at the same time, as I said uh, uh, during the presentation, revenues and costs for the new businesses will grow to deliver the 150 million EBITDA that we have indicated by 2024. Thank you. The next question is from Harry Weiberg, with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking my question. So, um, first one. So, sorry to, to uh, reprise again this uh, sort of early question on the on the pipeline uh, replacement. So, I, I just wanted to understand a bit more about how it's decided which pipelines you can uh, actually replace. Because I guess, uh, in some ways, you know. Presumably, you would want to replace as many as possible because you've either got you either keep the old pipeline and just get an opex allowance on it, which is probably a lot more time. But obviously, if you replace it, you get you know, your, your, your capex and your return on investment and your opex allowance. So, 
I guess when you go into these negotiations, presumably you're sort of minded to push for, for more replacement. So I just wondered what actual criteria does the regulator or, uh, or, or maybe the government use to decide which one gets replaced? And given that there's so much you know, focus on infrastructure investment and you know, GDP multipliers, would there be a scope to actually to perhaps do more pipeline replacement than, than you're currently uh, assuming in your 2.5% or over 2.5% wrap? Um, second one's very uh, big, big picture, I just given you know, you've got your uh, affiliate investments in gas transmission, you've got your your sort of new energy technology businesses, you've got your new you know, hydrogen technology businesses. In, in total, if we just look at things that, that, that are not to do with gas transmission, you know, what percentage of your net income are these investments going to be in sort of 2024, uh, and perhaps even in, in, in sort of 2040, because we can understand how much of the business uh, over the next few years is going to gravitate towards kind of non-gas transmission type uh, activity. And then third one, again, very big picture, but looking at things like Denora, you, you mentioned it's got very high growth rates. Clearly, it's in an area that's getting a huge amount of investor attention, a huge target, clearly a lot of growth potential. But I guess when, you, when you're combining that business with your core gas transmission business, um, is there a risk that you get end up with a conglomerate discount here? You know, these are very, very, very different business models. And I know you mentioned you're sort of spinning, potentially spinning this asset into a separate investment fund, but you know, is there a case for even going further than that and saying that we need to have an explicit subsidiary perhaps to, to house all of these technology type investments that have a different profile in the transition business so that they just get more accurately valued by the market. You know, I guess at the moment there's a risk that, that all these things get, get lost in some other parts. Okay. Thank you, Harry, for your question. So on replacement, there's no specific rule. Uh, we are in a, um, a very, I would say, comfortable place because we've had a very prudent approach to replacements. We've only uh, replaced what we felt was absolutely necessary, and the regulator really appreciates that. We could have replaced more, and we could replace more, and we could be here today with a greater uh, growth plan for replacements in the next four years and beyond. So we are believers in doing what's good and right for the system and not look at our short or medium-term interests. As I mentioned, looking at uh, today and looking at even 2040 and beyond, the cost uh, of uh, transporting energy uh, in our system is really, really low in percentage terms today and in percentage in relative terms uh, tomorrow. So we don't have, uh, let's say, pressure uh, from uh, an impact on, on consumers' point of view. Uh, at the same time, we're not using any rhetoric to say that we should boost replacements to boost GDP. We are, however, uh, saying that projects like Sardinia are absolutely necessary to uh, deliver cheaper and more sustainable energy to people in Sardinia who are now uh, still uh, living off uh, diesel and GPL to heat their homes. So that's really what's uh, governing our discussion is a prudent approach, a systemic approach. And what we have is a 10-year plan that we present on a rolling basis. And what we've provided until 2040 is a kind of continuation of that trend where we replace what is strictly necessary. Of course, as time goes by and as Italy has some uh, own geological complexities, uh, some of what is necessary becomes greater as the overall network becomes older. When it comes to uh, affiliates, uh, uh, and new energies and conglomerate discounts. So for the new businesses, I mentioned a target of 150 million of EBITDA. These are startups that are already break even today. Uh, if you assume they're break even now and get to 150 million, you get a sense of the very steep uh, trajectory they are on. Uh, we have invested a lot less in these businesses and what they would be worth today. And that worthness, that value is going to become visible as they get to meaningful 
uh, numbers towards uh, the end of the plan. Uh, we provide aggregate uh, view for our associates that will reach uh, from a net income contribution because uh, EBITDA is not relevant there, over 200 million. I think it's around 220 million uh, by the end of the plan. So if you add up 150 million of EBITDA, 220 million, I think you get to something which is increasingly increasingly meaningful. Then the new businesses also add RAB in a way because every biomethane, every CNG, every LNG connection uh, adds to the RAB. And they also contribute to uh, the green uh, gassing of our network. As the new businesses succeed, uh, new gases succeed, and our network doesn't become a transition infrastructure, but becomes a forever infrastructure that makes that whole replacement discussion a lot more interesting. So I don't think we're at the point of thinking of conglomerate discount. I think this new energy uh, investment platform that we talked about is already a very disciplined, ring-fenced, uh, let's say, vehicle in which we'll place a big part of Denora that is uh, is really an, a very attractive asset in itself and, and really can help us expand our hydrogen uh, leadership in many respects. Okay, many thanks. Thank you. The next question is from Alberto Gandolfi with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Good afternoon and thanks for taking my question. The first one is on, on hydrogen. I was wondering, I mean, you've been a key driving force of uh, the debate on the hydrogen in Europe and one of the key founding members, if I can say, of the EU backbone project, uh, which is about 40 billion euros just for the reconfiguration of pipes and compression stations without even calculating storage. So I, I guess my question is, can you share with us what percentage of this figure could be attributed to your core market in, in Italy? And should we just assume it's about 15% of that, and then we put maybe storage on top? I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to clarify, when you say 70% of your pipes is hydrogen ready, I wonder, so what's the investment need? Is it on the compression station, is it on storage, is it on different types of pipelines that you need to reconfigure? So maybe uh, combining the two and giving an idea for Italy would be great. Um, the second question is, on the non-regulated businesses of 150 million EBITDA, would it be possible maybe to break down just the main big components, just the two, three largest, and, and then perhaps give us an indication of what margin net income to EBITDA you'd be expecting from those. And last, on RAB growth, 2.5% floor growth per year, um, very helpful number. Thank you for that. Can I ask you what inflation assumptions have you baked in, in that type of goal? Thank you so much. Thank you, Alberto. So, on on this 40 billion, um, I'd be I get this question a lot. I'd be very tempted to just work out a percentage number. That would be an easy solution. But this 40 billion is a kind of a static figure. This assumes we go from where we are today to a fully hydrogen world and says, what do we need to change? Uh, what happens in between is incredibly complex. As I was trying to explain, we will have an overlay of uh, biomethane, methane, CCS, methane, so kind of blue hydrogen, CO2 that needs to be transported, as well as hydrogen that starts from zero and will increase gradually, first in blending and then on its own. And no doubt we will see uh, the development of dedicated hydrogen pipes uh, to anticipate the overall market to get perhaps to specific districts. And the big question still to be resolved is what happens in cities, what happens at the distribution level and at what pace. So I'm afraid that we are uh, working very hard. I don't think we will have an answer soon because we need to uh, map all the bits of the puzzle to get there. But if you think that in our um, uh, guidance that we gave on 2040, uh, we said that with 2.5% growth, we're still left with 11,000 kilometers of pipelines that eventually will need to be 
replaced in a way sooner or later. Uh, if you take the, the numbers we gave in the past as between one and three, we're now using 2.1 or 2.2 as an average point. You can easily get to a capex amount uh, potential for Italy that is not related to that 40 billion, if you see what I'm saying. So there's a lot of moving parts. I think the bottom line is that we see that uh, RAP growth, by the way, has 1% inflation embedded in it at 2.5%, excluding anything to do with hydrogen. And then we see different bits of hydrogen opportunity as we approach new districts, as we build, we or other people build electrolyzers that may or may not be connected to our pipe. And, and so it's a much more complex and dynamic uh, picture. Of course, uh, SNAM has a big share in the European market between our Italian and our associate pipelines. So you can easily uh, work the kind of the percentage uh, of that 40 billion, but that won't get you to what you're trying to calculate, which is the real uh, kind of bottom line uh, capex. So in terms of the new businesses, uh, the way uh, you can look at it is, uh, I've said hydrogen will reach break even. I think that's a heroic effort because in a, such a new market in such a short period of time uh, and and I think the break even to be fair to the business unit let's look let's assume it's break even at the gross margin level but that's already quite heroic um, uh, because it's with no subsidies then um, we have uh, the other businesses uh, where by methane we said double digit uh, return and you have the capex amount there so I think you can easily uh, work out where we are um, energy efficiency and and mobility uh, you can use as a floor or risk adjusted uh, regulated uh, returns the margins are good of course they're not as good as the regulated margins at 80 percent but Ali correct me if I'm wrong I think uh, behind those EBITDA figures we have north of 600 million of revenues or something or something like that maybe between six and seven hundred million uh, of revenue, so it's good margins, uh, not as rich as uh, as a core business. Thanks, Ma Marco. Forgive yeah. me for the follow up. I was wondering on the new businesses if you can help us also. This is very helpful. Thank you. And by the way, um, what would be net income from businesses? And and maybe one comment, if you allow me, so shut up. In, in a world where lots of companies assume a normalization in the world. I mean, it's interesting to see you're using 1% inflation. Some people might argue you could go back to 1.5 or 1.75. So essentially, long-term, it's a 3% drop growth floor. Okay, thanks for the comment. We like to stay on, on the prudent side. Um, uh, Ali, do you have anything to say on the... I think net income is around 50, maybe, uh, where you have uh, biomethane with higher uh, DNA uh, and energy efficiency. Uh, is is again uh, has has some uh, amortization as well. So I think you should think about it as kind of 50 million uh, net income, a bit south of 50 million. Thank you. Thanks. The next question is from Enrico Bartoli with Cipol. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so to, uh, I have a, a general question on hydrogen. There are a lot of discussions within the industry, what kind of a model the uh, hydrogen industry would take uh, if uh, there would be development of, uh, uh, of um, uh, capacity, uh, capacity spread over the territory or big uh, uh, capacity concentrated and then uh, the, the production of hydrogen to be transported to the, to the production site. Also, uh, how much will be produced in, in Europe uh, and the opportunity to import from uh, uh, I see from the flight 15 from North Africa, but uh, you mentioned also in the past uh, the, the potential from the Middle East. So I was wondering what is uh, uh, your view or your possible the possible scenario that uh, in which uh, this uh, this industry could develop uh, over over the next year. A second question is related to, to Sardinia. Uh, I was wondering how much uh, you include in terms of capex related to the investment in Sardinia. And uh, uh, recently there were uh, many, many discussions about uh, actually the, the, the backbone if uh, needed or not. I see that you include already some, uh, some capex there. If you can update us on, uh, on the state of the art on, uh, on this topic. And uh, um, the third one is on, on the assets, on the guidance that you, you gave of stable contribution 
In uh, 19, uh, the contribution was around 200 million. If you can uh, uh, give us uh, uh, a more precise uh, hint on what to expect in 2024, uh, if this is the level that we can uh, assume. Thank you. Thanks, Enrico. So I will answer the hydrogen model in the backbone, and then I will let Ale deal with the associates and with the uh, breakdown of, of Sardinia. Uh, so uh, I think it's early to tell. I, I foresee a model where we will both need to import hydrogen from outside of Europe, uh, because I expect that NIMBYism will continue and the gigawatts of new renewables that are necessary. I just don't see uh, where we will build them. There's a growing opposition to renewables. If I look at Germany, they have to get out of nuclear, they have to get out of coal, and they are not um, having um, a lot of growth in their own domestic uh, renewables. So there will be an opportunity and a need to import significant volumes of hydrogen. So when you start thinking of import, you're like, where do we import from? Well, like for natural gas, but even more because it's less dense and much more expensive to liquefy, the cost advantage I talked about is 1 to 10. So wherever possible, we will look for places and parts of the world where we can uh, pipe it whether it's Eastern Europe, whether it's uh, uh, Southeastern Europe, whether it's the Middle East with new projects, whether it's North Africa, and, and the same will happen uh, for other parts of the world where there are significant uh, spaces available with renewable potential, whether it's wind or sun. And of course, this is also true for offshore wind the potential is to create aggregate hydrogen and transport. I also see a model where if someone is building a hydrogen refueling station in a remote area, eventually over time, if there's space, it will become interesting and cheap to produce dedicated renewables for that petrol station. If there is a significant area which is neighboring, if there's maybe a wind turbine that's next door. I see uh, residential projects that have hydrogen at the home, uh, manufactured at home with uh, solar uh, in, 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 in the summer. So I think we will see an emergence of uh, several models. And I think there's space for uh, all these types of models. Uh, of course, what's important is that we don't make any bets uh, too early in the game. And I think Europe is really coordinating uh, the effort by having a lot of conference calls, a lot of dialogues, a lot of private uh, public uh, partnerships. And, uh, and I think IPCHE is a great uh, investment uh, mechanism because it forces European countries to collaborate and, and to share. On um, the blue versus green, as I mentioned, I think there will be the uh, necessary of having of having the um, of having blue hydrogen uh, to get the market going. And certainly, Germany and the UK have told me that they're looking at having uh, significant amounts of blue hydrogen in the mix uh, for a number of years, which is not a short period of time in their intentions. So I think Europe will need to again move in a coordinated way. When it comes to uh, the backbone, we are bringing gas to Sardinia. That's the good news. It's happening by 2024 at the latest. We have the opportunity uh, to have a project now that uh, doesn't have the opposition that you are referring to. Uh, we are not talking about an extensive point-to-point uh, -point backbone. We're rather talking about parts of backbone that are built around the clusters of demand with potential offshoots, whether it's dedicated smaller lines or uh, trucks to deliver gas uh, to areas that maybe have very low uh, demand. Uh, um, uh, and so LNG is a good way to move, uh, to move uh, uh, gas around as well. So we have that opportunity. Ale, maybe yeah. if you can give more details on I the costs. I think uh, you rightly refer to approximately 200 million of contribution from associate uh, in 2019. These were also including, as we commented in the past, one-off effect, which were very significant for DESFA, which are 
accounted for approximately 30 million, which, as we said, since the very beginning, the, con the normalized contribution for DESPA is something that we've always expected to be in the 10 to 15 million. So we are benefiting from an incredibly positive scenario, which is accelerating tariff recovery from the past, which will normalize uh, in due course in 2021, is actually, as I commented before, the first year where this is, is going to happen. And the same when it comes to Terega, there were one-off uh, effects, which once normalized, take another 10, 15 million off. So if you take those numbers, you normalize for what are one-off, and then you have the gradual uh, reduction that we have commented on on the Austrian, then you have, of course, the positive contribution of uh, TAP and of ADNOC. And overall, uh, the contribution of our associates is, as Marco said before, uh, around 220 is like above that number. So it will go up as a portfolio, but with different contribution in 2024 versus what we had in 2019. The next question is from Jose Ruiz with Barclays. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for taking my question. I just have two. The first one is um, you mentioned seven, uh, 500 million euros in, di in CapEx in di digitalization. I was wondering if these are RAB related. Uh, I I'm, guess I'm guessing the point I, I want to get is from your 6.7 billion investment plan, how much is not RAB related? And the second question is, um, is a follow-up on something you said before. You, you were mentioning 2021, a critical year to find, um, I understand, if I understood correctly, incentives for electrolyzers. Um, my question is basically, when is uh, the debate about regulation on infrastructure, uh, hydrogen infrastructure, going to take a place? After that, uh, two years later, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jose Luis. So uh, the technology investments of 500 are in the RAB, and what's outside of the RAB are the 700 million euros for uh, the new uh, businesses. That's uh, our CapEx breakdown. Um, when it comes to hydrogen regulation, I think in a normal uh, in a normal situation, it may take two to three years. I think there is a, a strong desire from uh, very top policymakers in Europe and in member states and around the world to accelerate this. So I see very uh, an acceler a rapid pace. Uh, the, I, I, I see a lot of uh, efforts to really um, come to some uh, coordinated views. There's, there was a conference call last week. There's another conference call uh, this week. Uh, so hopefully by the end of 2021, we have already greater visibility on the direction of travel. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Olivier van Roteler with Exam. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, good, uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for, for taking my questions as well. Uh, I have a, a two topics on side of questions. Uh, first one is on the um, energy transition businesses. So you mentioned uh, 720 million uh, euros of capex on that one. Uh, but I wonder, how, how do you think about the investment in Donora? Is that something separate? I think it was 400 million uh, that we've gone as well. And then I think you also mentioned uh, around 200 million uh, to be invested in this um, in this fund that you would like to launch next year, is that something separate that we should add on top as well? And I guess in just a wider question, you, you highlight how, these, um, how your plan doesn't include potential opportunities that could still emerge from, from, from the market as, as actually subsidy schemes get, get designed on, on, on such items. How much are you actually willing to invest overall uh, in these type of non-regulated activities in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the plan period? Um, and then the second topic is on blending. Uh, if I understood correctly, I think you mentioned that Italy was targeting uh, around 2% of, um, of hydrogen blending and the gas mix by 2030, uh, which may seem like a low number. I think you had in the past mentioned that uh, you thought that it could be possible to go to 10% or even more. Uh, so I was just wondering if, if it would be just 2% for, for Europe as a whole, would, would there be enough demand uh, by 2030 to absorb 
uh, the, the, uh, the forty gigawatt of Venezuela has the capacity, and certainly if we had also actually imported from the from the other forty gigawatt outside Europe, uh, that can just based on the on, on the full hydrogen industry to you highlight um flux potentially and uh, uh, in change. And then relating also for you, if the blending is only two percent by then, uh, would you then caution people in being too optimistic in terms of how much there would need to be an acceleration? Of replacement of, of your fully amortized pipeline in the mid 2020s, uh, if at the end the adoption of hydrogen proves to be much more gradual. Um, thank you. Thanks, Olivier. So um, the Denora and the uh, energy transition platform are not included. So you could add uh, the Denora contribution and 402 million of cash out sometime in 2021. Um, that figure that you've mentioned for the investment platform uh, is ballpark right. We won't know until we get there next year, uh, but uh, you shouldn't double count because we've also said that part, part of Denora would be used as a seed asset for that fund. So money will go out and money will come uh, back uh, in a way. I hope uh, that is clear. So uh, we, we don't have any targets in mind and we won't be setting any targets for these new opportunities because it will depend on um, what opportunities uh, we see over time and we will update you as, uh, as they uh, materialize. Uh, the numbers we've given do not have any upside coming from blending uh, as this is just in a highlight but hasn't been yet detailed as to how that, that would work. So blending at 2% would be an upside uh, to our numbers if there's any uh, business uh, for us in the blending uh, that is not simply just receiving uh, the blend, which, which could be the case. When um, we look at 2%, the great news that we're able to deliver today is that our experts with the leading universities have given us a green light to accept 2% blend in the storage. This is the first time that we believe this happens in underground uh, gas uh, depleted reservoirs that we use for natural gas storage. And, and so this opens the door to doing the 2% blend in the network, because as you know, the network and the storage sites are integrated and interconnected. So it would have been impossible to accept 2% if the storage wasn't able to accept that 2%. So that's our bottleneck. The pipe itself could take, as I said, even up to 100 on 70% of our infrastructure, then we would need to replace the valves. The storage today can take up to 2% without changing anything. And we're continuing to investigate and explore what we can do. You're right in pointing out that 40 gig is very ambitious. And now our job as midstreamers, this is what we've been doing in the 70s and the 90s when the gas market developed in Europe in two waves. We've been trying to build supply and demand at the same time. And so we have to go back to our roots and, and try to help the system uh, do the same, talking to uh, suppliers of renewables who are upstream and consumers of hydrogen who are downstream of our infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question is from Bartek Kubicki with the Citizen Round. Please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. Three questions I made from my side. Firstly, on your non-regulated, of course, a lot has been said already, but I wonder what are the uh, downside risks to your to your 150 million FDDA guidance? Uh, I mean, especially in terms of competition, in terms of any pressure margin. Uh, a lot of your peers are, is trying to get into energy efficiency. I wonder whether you are seeing any pressure on uh, on profitability already, or the market is growing to the extent that it can, it can accommodate uh, many players. So that would be my first question. Secondly, I wanted to ask about your cost of financing. You're assuming 1.2%, which to me seems to be quite conservative, given the fact that your longest maturing bond, 2034, yields something like 0.38%. Uh, so I wonder why are you so, so conservative? And also on your financing, whether you can tell us what is the advantage in terms of cost of financing of the sustainable uh, sustainable uh, financing, given the fact that yields are so low? And thirdly, on your FDDA guidance, 3% CAGR until 2024, 
150 million will come from non-regulated. It looks like the regulated part, just on those numbers, will grow at something like 1.5, 1.7 percentage points. So I would like you to confirm or challenge this number or just tell us what do you assume. Thank you very much. Thanks for your question. I will take the first and then Ale, I will leave you the uh, second and third. So the... Um, the, uh, the businesses are uh, indeed uh, competitive uh, and uh, when we started these businesses uh, we were almost uh, alone in certain respects in certain sectors and as uh, uh, we've, we've grown, as the markets have grown, competition is indeed intensifying. There is significant opportunity for uh, everyone to have uh, an important part. The, the pie is growing much faster than our top line is growing. So this is uh, not about uh, uh, competi competition squeezing margins. This is about a market that is, that is growing very fast. Uh, the uh, incentives and the subsidies will, in a way, uh, increase uh, the market even further when it comes certainly to biomethane and to hydrogen in a way that's already happened for energy efficiency with the new fiscal incentives. So these will be competitive segments, but in a way, once the incentive is there, and once you secure the contract, it's not like you really have downside. Now, of course, 150 million of EBITDA starting from a very low base in just four years is a very, very significant ramp up that I haven't seen in many other sectors. So we've been ambitious in our targets. There is uh, room for mistakes, there is room for delays. Uh, we've, uh, we've already seen a delay in 2020 on biomethane because of COVID. And so, um, and so this is uh, uh, an area where we are setting ourselves ambitious targets. There is downside risk to those, but there's also potential upside opportunity as those incentives firm up. Ale. On the on the cost of funding, uh, we, we clearly take advantage of the lower curve that we see going forward. Um, but as always, when we forecast long term, we don't, and that's the same every year, we don't factor the fact we may continue to do some treasury optimization uh, if the market remains uh, as accessible as it is today. And that could lead, some, lead to some room for further improvement versus the 1.2 average uh, that we say in the plan. It's an average, so it's slightly higher at the end and it's slightly lower at the beginning. Um, we will continue to be very uh, opportunistic and proactive on managing our li liabilities and be reassured that we're not going to be uh, sitting on, on the decline that we've achieved to date and we will continue to do, uh, trying to do something better than that. On the sustainable funding, uh, there's an ongoing debate whether sustainable funding will deserve and, and call for a cheaper cost of funding versus traditional funding. I think the jury is out. My, my inclination is to think that over time, people that will not be as focused and committed to sustainability and sustainable funding and have ESG at the core of their strategy may have less competitive uh, financing terms than those that do versus a situation where vis-a-vis -vis where we see the market today uh, our cost of funding would get uh, a direct uh, benefit. But, uh, of course, uh, either way, uh, I think it's the important thing is our commitment to sustainable, to growing our share of sustainable financing. And should the market evolve towards giving a premium for that, of course, we will seek to capture that uh, as part of our cost of funding. On the EBITDA, I think you are right. I mean, there is a slower uh, pace at the EBITDA level versus, uh, versus the, 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 the RAB growth. I think one important element is the uh, is related to the Sardinia project that we discussed before, which on the regulated side is effectively pushing beyond the plan uh, a significant contribution in terms of EBITDA that actually was in the plan last year. Uh, and so that's, that's already a, a good part of it. I think that uh, it's also important vis-a-vis -vis the CAGR that we had uh, last year to keep in mind that we are starting from a different base and simply rolling in and starting from a higher base and having a long, one, long uh, longer term, a longer year, 
uh, also take away part of the growth that uh, that we had uh, last year. But I would say, in the regulated space, uh, Sardinia is the key project that uh, we see moving from within the plan and beyond the plan, as uh, uh, Marco explained before. Uh, and the fact that we are investing more also, as always, we have a delay uh, in the timeline of uh, recognition of the full contribution of CAPEX because depreciation related to CAPEX comes in our revenues uh, with two years of, of gap. And so in a, in a CAPEX plan which is seeing a significant increase, uh, that's something that, uh, as it is back-ended, is, uh, uh, is impacting our uh, EBITDA CAGR. Thank you. The next question is from Antonella Gianchetti, with Chiki. Please go ahead. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, so, a few questions on my side uh, to understand uh, if uh, your plan is truly supporting the environment and customer. Uh, the first one, uh, every year you are revising CAPEX, uh, uh, largely due to maintenance and replacing. So can you tell us what are you discovering that is justifying this rising investment? So is the replacement needed and the needed benefit for consumers? Uh, is the non network particularly obsolete, is dangerous, or is largely down to the regulatory situation with no real benefit for consumers? The second question is on uh, uh, the hydrogen coming from Africa. Uh, it seems to me a bit illogical from the EU to basically fighting CO2 emissions from subtracting appreciable resources of you know, renewable gener uh, generation in Africa. So how does this make sense in the context of the global decarbonization? Um, which are the benefits that you think you, uh, you know, the, this potential project will deliver to the overall picture and also to, to Africa? And uh, also, uh, I'm hearing about this uh, potential. I, I'm not hearing anyone having a precise uh, project in terms of developing renewable capacity on, for this purpose. Uh, I'm hearing from the transmission company. Uh, would you consider to invest directly in terms of renewable generation in the area? Uh, the third one is on the blending. I mean, we know that the kind of electricity generation is still 50% coming from that. So if you divert renewable resources to produce hydrogen to put it in your pipes, this will, will end up leading to more CCGT production. So, and worsening the overall metrics uh, of Italy in terms of emissions. So, have you thought about that? Uh, is uh, the overall implication of your action included in your assessment when you're looking at the ESG targets? And then finally, my last question is that on the contribution, I, I need the number on the contribution of the, the equity participation in 2024, so if you kindly can uh, repeat it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonella. So I will uh, try to answer your first four questions, and then uh, Alessandro will answer your fifth. Which uh, can you can you repeat your fifth? What you want to know the contribution of what? Of the equity participation to to the numbers in twenty four. Of of the international associates. Yes. Okay. So. Um, uh, or let's start with the substitution, which uh, I've now said several times. The uh, plan we have in the 10-year, uh, the, the numbers we have in the 10-year plans are shared with regulator and with the government. That's very visible. It's online. There's nothing really new. If you look at page 22 that we've provided just for this purpose, you see how, because a lot of the infrastructure was built in the 70s, this is a recent issue. Uh, until four years ago, there was no substitution. And we've always said that substitution is ramping up. We've now reached a level where we predict this 1,200 kilometers over four years, which is not enough to uh, contain what is aging. As mentioned, we take a a very prudent approach and we replace what we feel is technically necessary. We run an, a cost-benefit analysis 
which is, uh, of course, very positive uh, when we look at the impact of these replacements. And as I mentioned, the relationship and the dialogue with the regulator is very constructive and very transparent, as we think that it should be. So we're not trying to accelerate anything beyond what is uh, strictly necessary. When it comes to uh, global uh, decarbonization and North Africa, we have nothing, zero, related to any of this in our numbers, and I don't see it as being meaningful in the short term. When I hear other countries in Europe who are very hungry, perhaps more than Italy, for green hydrogen, and they are looking at their options to source big quantities of green hydrogen. They are themselves in advanced discussions with many countries in Africa, West Africa, North Africa, in the Middle East, and this is all uh, publicly available information. So when they develop these projects, all we're saying is based on Bloomberg's work and other works that it is 10 times cheaper to deliver green hydrogen via pipe than it is to than it is to liquefy and to uh, put it on a ship. So the benefit is significant because it could be for many countries the cheapest or in some cases the only uh, way to decarbonize. Of course, uh, like any uh, development activity in emerging countries, it would have to be done in a constructive approach, in a win-win approach as uh, other uh, companies have been doing. Now, the, the idea of building renewables in the deserts uh, is not new at all. There have been uh, failed attempts for uh, many uh, decades. We have now the opportunity to envisage a market where you're no longer trying to move electrons over long distances, because to move electrons uh, has the same type of cost disadvantage as to liquefy the hydrogen. So the real opportunity here, which is unleashed by the hunger for hydrogen in Europe, by that need to have 40 uh, gigawatts of demand, by that need in certain countries to phase out coal and phase out nuclear, uh, to really uh, give us uh, the um, uh, opportunity to think of our network as a pathway for renewable energy, as this is by far uh, the cheapest way to move and to store a renewable energy from long distances and to deliver it where and when necessary. And let's also remember of the need to have winter uh, renewable energy available for heating at times when the, uh, the, the, the sun is, is not shining at its best. When it comes to blending, uh, again, nothing about blending is in our plan. Nothing about blending is in our long-term uh, assumptions in the numbers that we share with you today. Blending is not the most energy efficient way to consume green hydrogen. If we had factories and buses and trucks and homes available to take green hydrogen today, that would be from an energy perspective, a cleaner and better use of green hydrogen. However, if we look at the opportunity and the need to build up supply and demand in parallel manners, blending becomes by far the cheapest way to accommodate green hydrogen to begin to take it into the system because up to 2%, as we've said today, there's no need for incremental infrastructure, no need for additional investments. So this becomes a demand pocket for green hydrogen at zero cost. That contributes to decarbonizing the uh, gas consumption, the gas grid, contributes to making the grid greener, uh, but is not necessarily from an energy perspective uh, the best way. Um, Ale, do you want to, um, uh, sorry, the green hydrogen in the blending would be uh, produced with dedicated renewables, so it wouldn't necessarily be produced from electrolyzers attached to the grid. Uh, when you think about the electricity grid, you can, in Europe, assume an average wholesale electricity price of over 50 
uh, euros per megawatt hour. When you think about renewables in Portugal, the latest price reference was around 11 euros per megawatt hour. Now, the load factor is there. You need to levelize out the costs. But uh, when you think about big volumes, it's more convenient to think about uh, going direct from solar to hydrogen than going from solar to grid uh, and from grid to hydrogen, especially if there's uh, meaningful distances involved. Yeah, on, on the <clears throat> contribution for from our associates, as, as we said before, the overall contribution by 2024 is expected to be uh, around 220 million or, or slightly above that number, um, including the phenomenon that I discussed earlier in terms of normalization of the contribution from uh, DESFA and Terega, and the uh, factor, uh, the, the, the impact of the um, termination and expiry of long-term contracts that are going to be replaced by short-term contracts, uh, although uh, backed by stable uh, gas flows uh, as when it relates to our Austrian associates. Antonella, have we answered to all your questions? Yes, perfectly. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from Stefano Gamberini with Equita Team. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good afternoon. I have three questions if you need. The first regarding uh, um, your investments for retrofitting, uh, hydrogen retrofitting of your pipes, 50% of the total. Could be considered uh, in terms of uh, uh, cost benefit analysis uh, as failure creation for the sector. Uh, my question is related to the fact that the regulator stressed uh, that uh, for developed, developing investments, uh, uh, CBA should be above 1.5 times. So, how you can consider this kind of uh, replacement investments uh, also on this point of view? Clearly, this is uh, if you, if you do some. Exercise on on that because my my topic is to understand uh, if in the future the regulator will introduce the topics regulation. Uh, you see some risk for your uh, replacement investments, or in this case, uh, could be not at risk. The second question regarding the under uh, what formula that in 2022 will be updated. You expect a flat work, uh, but. Uh, um, considering the, the, the actual, the current situation of, uh, of uh, also the spread between uh, bond and, uh, and, uh, and BTP, do you see the risk of a reduction? And in this case, uh, how you can um, offset this uh, reduction? What I mean is that you expect that the regulator could introduce some uh, output-based incentives for your business and, the, and, and um, or alternatively do you have some other um, contingency plan for this uh, for this risk. The third question regarding uh, new investments and acquisition in energy transition, 3.7 billion by 2024, but you stress that in the forthcoming years, uh, uh, new opportunities should arrive. Could you give us an idea, an idea of the flexibility that you have considering your financial targets to keep uh, debt on RAB below 60%? So how could uh, reinvesting for coming year or increase these investments uh, up to 2024. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. So the current CBA cost-benefit analysis methodology assumes certain values for CO2 uh, reduction. Those are already included, for instance, when we look at our uh, dual fuel compressor stations. In the future, I expect the CO2 component will become uh, more heavy and the way the CBA will work, I expect, is to compare the hydrogen retrofitting to alternative ways of delivering uh, green energy to that uh, customer, that community, that city, or, or whatever the situation may be. So the model is already there, and I think CO2 will play an increasing role in, in some type of CBA methodology. The, uh, some, some countries, not Italy yet, but some countries are discussing introducing some premia when it comes to a retrofitting. We are not there 
uh, yet, and I don't know where that will take. Uh, we don't hear any discussions of TOTEX yet, as we used to say three years ago when it was uh, more trendy to talk about TOTEX, is that TOTEX could be an opportunity more than a threat, uh, given everything that's going on for us. The WAC, we've taken the view that uh, so long as we tell you exactly what the assumptions are, then everyone can plug into our uh, base, base case, their own view of inflation, of deflator, of spreads, uh, because otherwise the risk is that we keep changing the assumptions and it becomes very difficult and challenging for you to compare our plan year after year. Of course, if we were to market to market today, there would be a decrease in the WAC. Uh, we are working on output-based incentives. A big part of those were related to the substitutions that I've mentioned have been uh, progressing, but that will shift from 2020 into the later parts of 2021. So I wouldn't see it as something that is compensated or that we have a backup plan. I think the WAC is just a function of uh, where the macro uh, economic uh, data will uh, bring uh, the WAC to, but we are constantly in discussions with the regulator to look for win-win solutions that help uh, consumers uh, improve the quality of service and get a better uh, service for what they pay for. When it comes to the investments, as mentioned, it's earlier to provide any guidance. We have that 60% level. We are in continuous dialogue with our rating agencies. Of course, that 60% means that we need to invest in assets that have the same risk profile or have some form of RAP, like TAP. It's not a RAP base, but the, regular, the, the, the rating agencies see it as a sort of a RAP. So that's the flexibility we have right now, and then uh, we, we could potentially down the line envisage some uh, disposals of non-core stakes if we see uh, greater and more attractive investment opportunities as well. Thank you, Stefano. Next question is from Javier Garrido with JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks for taking the questions, particularly after uh, such a long call. And we'll try to be brief. Uh, first question is a clarification on what you just said. Uh, so far, you've been buying stakes in international assets, but you haven't really sold any meaningful uh, stake. Uh, is a situation like that uh, a potential candidate for disposal, given that uh, now is being the risk and um, um, could be attractive for investors with very low uh, WAC assumptions? And then the second question is more a um, philosophical one. When you started your initiatives in new energies, in biomethane particularly, and also in hydrogen, my understanding is that you were uh, particularly willing to perform the role of an enabler of those uh, technology developments. Um, but I, I can see now uh, you, uh, you seem to be growing your ambitions. Um, is there not a potential conflict of interest here, uh, at least in the medium to long run, uh, particularly with the regulator, for example, in the planning of infrastructure, in the decision on where to, to invest in regulated assets, if uh, hydrogen were to be regulated, for example, or a potential conflict of interest with the uh, potential clients for, for these uh, businesses. I would like to understand to which extent uh, you uh, have ambitions to, to grow these uh, new businesses and, and uh, as an alternative or uh, an additional business line versus your core regulated business. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. So uh, I wouldn't comment on, on specific assets, but as you highlighted, it's uh, certainly true that uh, there's some people out there with very low wax that could offer uh, attractive uh, returns or attractive premia on some of our assets. And uh, some of our assets uh, are, are very uh, desirable uh, and uh, we have uh, received, as, as is customary, uh, several approaches. Right now we consider our portfolio uh, to be very attractive as we've described in the course of this presentation. I was just hinting to the fact that if we see greater investment op investment opportunities with greater risk-adjusted returns than assets we may have, we may consider uh, to shift uh, capital from 
uh, those lower uh, return assets to higher. Now, the asset you mentioned is a top performer uh, with above 10%. So ideally, we would add more of those types of assets with those types of risk-adjusted returns, which are significantly higher than our regulated returns to our portfolio. And TAP is a great example of where not only we've contributed to its delivery on time and on budget, but we've also made contracts with TAP from our global solutions subsidiary to provide very valuable and precious services for the benefit of TAP and its other shareholders, but also for a profit to SNAP. When it comes to your philosophical question, we already have potentially that issue like any other uh, utility that also owns uh, networks, whether it's uh, gas or electricity networks at the distribution or transmission level anywhere in the world. Our regulated businesses are ring-fenced. We already operate our biomethane and CNG activities, for example, in a Chinese wall a manner so that there's no transfer of information from one side to the other, and I must say it works well. Uh, we are uh, working on the assumption that these are still very small activities compared to our overall business, and so there is a sandboxing approach that uh, Europe uh, is taking to a, a lot of these businesses. The question will arise maybe in a decade or so if we end up having very significant uh, business positions, uh, how to deal with unbundling. And here there are several debates ongoing in Europe. Uh, there's people saying that the gas restrictions should apply. There's other people saying that because hydrogen needs to take off, the hydrogen and uh, the natural gas and unbundling directives were built for other purposes and should now uh, not be applicable to hydrogen. So again, I think in 2021, we will see what that uh, longer term outlook uh, will look like. But for now, we're operating like many, I would say most other uh, utilities, uh, making sure that there's no conflict of interest. And if any arise, that we manage it uh, properly as expected. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Mr. Alverani, continue. There are no more questions registered at this time. So thank you all very much for uh, your attention earlier and for your very interesting questions. And have uh, a good day. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.